to hand the mic off to Ken Peterman. And if, if you would introduce yourselves to something about your work um, and where you're from and take the um, I'm Ken I have a company called Cat Enterprises where I do work for professional justice and liberation. Um, I'm from the land of pine straw, pine trees, pine needles, cypress knees, and the dark water. I'm also from the land of the cultural presentation that we had this morning, so another big shout out for our cat little turtle, tail little turtle and Nakaya. I was really happy um, to see them in the space today because we don't always get to see that. Um, is there anything else you want for me to do the introduction? We'll go right into the work. So um, challenges, I'm in actually North Carolina, so being invited to this conversation, I'm grateful. Um, so because there's just so much similarity between rural Appalachia and rural North Carolina where I'm from. I'm from a particular, particularly interesting county, Robinson County, North Carolina, that is pretty much quadracial. So we have almost 38% um, Native American, about 25% African American, about 25% um, European American, mostly Scottish, um, and uh, lately because the agricultural community, we've had an influx of Latinx, and then we're also beginning to see some um, Middle Eastern folks join um, our community, um, and we're getting a lot of diversity in religion. So it's ripe with opportunity um, as well as challenge. I think some of the challenges for us around the arts and theater. Um, most of all, we don't always have a lot of money to go see published theater in my community. Um, about 30% of folks live uh, in the poverty level. So $15 is a, is a lot of money. Um, but we're learning that churches create theater, uh, culture creates theater, creates opportunity. Um, we struggle with public transportation, so we always have to, I think it was one of the panels before making sure you voted transportation, childcare, and food, because sometimes food is security. Um, is a real thing in our community. Um, what I love about it though is that we are such natural storytellers and we, um, we tell stories to each other all the time. Sometimes they're true. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, sometimes not so much. Um, but storytelling is such an inherent part of who we are. But what I think our, our challenge is is to tell them cross-culturally. We are still very siloed in the way that we tell our stories. So you know, we sit together and tell ours, African Americans sit together and tell theirs, most of the Americans sit together and tell theirs, and we're not necessarily um, telling them collectively. However, we do recognize that that's an opportunity. So um, we have done some things. We've created arts councils, where it's arts guild as an opportunity to uh, bring folks together. And even in doing that, even in the beauty of art and creative practices, also witness our internalized oppressions come up because it is an old um, Jim Crow South community and sandbox politics still plays a big part in the things that we're looking to do. Um, and it's really interesting to witness um, us push against our own boxes that we put ourselves in as well as the structures uh, that can keep us um, bound. So those are some of the challenges um, that we have in Robinson County as well as you know, we get the 100 year flood every other year. Uh, which makes for a little bit of challenge when you're creating art. Um, but uh, we're moving through. We're really learning that um, art is a healing medicine. And again, I think our big challenge is to do it not only for our own culture, but to do it for others. Um, and to that end, we started the Green Art Skill. Uh, two years ago, we started the Lovely Film Festival. Um, we started an artist market so folks can be able to um, sell their wares. We have a monthly community film series that is really more cross-cultural. Um, and folks are beginning to talk, so this is the first year for that. Um, and then we have music series, Peace in the Park, and then cultural events around Native Americans, and Native Americans, Scotch Americans. So that's a little bit of what's happening in our community. Is that what you're doing? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Becky Sidney. New director of Roadside Theater, who was previously spoken of in our last panel. And our, um, so, everything I say today about my experience of Appalachian geography is with the caveat that I've only been there for four months. Uh, I'm from central Kentucky, but that is a very different place than southeastern Kentucky. Um, so, 
One of the things I wanted to talk about today was the fact that due to a whole host of realities, many of them economic, but as we know, um, the economy affects so many different aspects of what we organize our lives around. Um, in Lutcher County, population has been decreasing. And because of this, you have a phenomenon going on where schools are being consolidated, churches are being consolidated, and so folks have a longer way to travel to get to the centers of civic life that used to be very accessible. Because Lutcher County is a, a series of a dozen or more uh, independent communities, each with their own post office and churches and schools, and that is shifting pretty radically. And so this is a reality um, that can do positive effects and negative effects just like um, the geography of Lutcher County has been affecting folks for a long time because on the one hand you've got uh, a kind of beautiful uh, individual culture and sense of caretaking for each other that can develop when you've got uh, communities that are very strong and geographically isolated but then you also have the negative effects of that isolation which is there's a lack of exchange or that things become inaccessible um, and like I said those centers of civic life as things become farther and farther spread out are more difficult to get access to for some folks. So this is a, a reality that I feel like roadside should be responding to and um, there is one more thing I wanted to bring up today which is uh, because over the weekend, I was reading an article, that was a paper that's been published recently, called Deep Adaptation, A Map for Navigating Climate Tragedy. And I feel like because geography is the relationship between people and their environment, that I don't want to sit on a panel about geography without talking about the fact that our national relationship to the environment is like currently an unsustainable one. And um, I feel that that unsustainable relationship has been built on systems of extraction, which we've talked a little bit about today, and that has hugely impacted the folks in Lutcher County and the surrounding region over the last century, both for good and for ill, depending on who you're talking to and when you're talking to. And, um, so I feel like that is wrapped up in a, a challenge and there's also an opportunity in that, so I'm kind of, kind of smooshing the two together here. But that is the fact that there is an inspiring reality in Metro County right now, which is that there is a complexity of voices there surrounding uh, this idea of geography, of humans related to their environment. And uh, that complexity of voices could be a leader and should be a leader in talking about one of the most pressing issues of my generation and of all of humanity, which is, um, is this our current unsustainable relationship to the way that uh, we use our environment to relate to it. Uh, I'll wrap it up. What was the question? Or am I going to do that part? I'm Hassan Davis from Berea, Kentucky. I am the founding director of Hassan Davis Solutions, HD Solutions. I am an author, a poet, a playwright, and an actor, a lawyer, and a juvenile justice advocate, and who? And today is Sunday. <laughs> and we have a five That's really what we're all doing. But, um, so my, my experience of of Appalachia in particular uh, over the last 30 years has been one grounded in, in, in my experience of Berea College which brought me to the region and the work uh, that I and my wife do uh, across rural Kentucky in particular, across Appalachia, uh, and really engaging first in education access, but the responsibility of realizing that to create education, promise, and possibility in communities that have been underserved and disserved you have to actually bring everything. And I, I wrote, you know, conversations really about when you want to do art in these communities, you have to bring everything. And it really is about having the courage to walk into places. As an African American man, uh, you know, to, to walk into places with the intention of, of doing as much good as I can for children that don't look like me, act like me, talk like me, think like me, believing that that relationship, that opportunity creates 
amazing new things, you know, to, to drive into the community and increase the population of color by percentages, right? And stop at the gas station. You must say, you must be the guy going to the school to do programming this week. Well, yeah, I think so. But why did you say that? Well, last week they said a black guy was coming to do programming in school. You only black guy to see such thing. And, and so, so for me, coming out of the streets of Atlanta, Georgia, coming up in a system that in so many ways was segregated, and walking into these communities across the, the mountains, <coughs> into places where young people leave me ask me, why are you here? And not a black person, why did you waste your time, your energy, your passion to create something better for me when the whole world has told us our stories don't match? And so for me, geography, this this, this space is, is sacred because it's it's a place where we get to to step into the, the possibility of the last panel uh, where the story that was talking about this idea that we get to actually create and rename an experience in so many ways. And so uh, my experience of the challenges is that there's trust, there's deep history of stereotypes, um, and those assumptions drive a lot of folks' reactions to us, to me, with the expectation that those assumptions explicitly stated will drive me, obviously, from the community to prove that I clearly wasn't there for every child. And I think that's something that, that again, I, I think from the lens of being a, a fairly liberal person in fairly conservative communities, you know, I think that is the, the thing that happens to all of them. There's this push to prove that we don't really need to come and do good work for the people in the community. And usually that push is, is orchestrated by those obvious stereotypical challenges that allow us the opportunity to say, you know what, if you're going to speak to me like that, you're going to use those words. If you're going to come into that attitude, then I'm not going to be here, which takes us right back to see you. I knew you really were just like the rest of them, right? In, in economy and in communities, we've been, been not just extracting natural resources, right? We've been extracting spirit, soul, energy, and, 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 and passion. And so the expectation that we're just going to be more of the same, especially if you come with a different lens, a complete total package difference. You know, the assumption that there's no way I could actually hold in my head and heart the promise and possibility of the region in a way that is authentic and natural and you know, conciliatory. In spite of the challenges that we face together, I had the pleasure and the challenge of running the state juvenile justice system for Kentucky for six years, of being vice chair of the Federal Advisory Commission on Juvenile Justice for the Nation and Territories for three years, and in the work I realized that the lens that art draws to communities that have been displaced and challenged, and I see that in Appalachia even more so. The art as a tool for retaining and transforming our communities is clearly there. The access to that art in the communities that are absolutely challenged by it in, in these mountain regions uh, and, and rural across the country, I think, is, is the issue that we still face. 25% uh, of all rural communities are communities of color, even though here in Appalachia it plays out different. So when we talk about how we serve those people, the least, the lost, the left behind, I think it really has to be a comprehensive conversation about both one to, to tap down our own experience to allow a new experience to collectively to, to, to rise. And I, I think that's our challenge and our opportunity. And I still don't know what the question was. <laughs> That's good. So. <laughs> uh, my name is Robert Guy. I'm here representing a group of people in Marlin County, Kentucky, which is uh, across Pine Mountain from where Becca lives. And uh, uh, we're, we got involved. I, I used to I work at a community college. I work at Southeast Kentucky Community Technical College. Uh, I came east of Kentucky in 1989 to work for Apple Shop which we heard discussed earlier. And uh, after six years, uh, I was ready to stop having to depend on the vagaries of philanthropists, whether or not I got paid that year. So uh, I became a philanthropist there for a minute. And then I came to work for the state. And in uh, 2001, we did a thing. Um, my students in Appalachian State went to Washington to talk to the Appalachian Regional Commission about uh, our community and what it had going for it, and uh, we uh, they asked me on the way home uh, where did, uh, uh, where grants come from, and I knew, and so I told them. And so then uh, that led to us getting involved in a community.
community process, uh, we became aware, thanks to a friend that I was shot, about um, a program that the Rockefeller Foundation was then doing that was uh, to use the arts um, to respond to uh, a community challenge. And so we, we did a community process to write a proposal about how to use um, the arts to respond to the opioid crisis. And as a part of that, um, we did a lot of interviewing. We ended up, our proposal was in using uh, uh, Tom Mosaic public art and uh, photography. We bought 600 single use cameras. That was kind of uh, the sunset of film. Um, I was I'm from Kingsport, Tennessee, which has a large chemical plant. It used to be a part of the East of Kodak Empire. If y'all are any y'all old enough to remember them, and so we, you know, it was in my blood to help buy film. That every time a person took a picture, a child in Kingsport got their wings. And so, uh, we then, uh, but then we, and we also were involved in that project. I was thinking about this earlier when we were talking about the Storytelling Center and the, the awesome work that they're doing around peace. Is we got involved with the Rural Southern Voice for Peace, which used storytelling to, or just really conversations that, that first one on one and then in groups to help people deal with things. But anyway, so uh, we work with Joe Carson, uh, rest your soul, very playwright, and um, uh, we wrote an honest and kind musical, worked with several different professional artists, Jerry Straub, Nikki, um, Kevin I, and Jeff, uh, A.C. Hickox, Jerry Matheny, and others, and had 80 people in a, in a musical in our county of 25,000 people. And I was thinking about them, uh, but that sun was shining in our face, because uh, we work with people that don't usually get in plays. I think that it really was a good um, experience for me about how the arts can help people process stuff. So we had all these people uh, who were had one really, I'm not really in the theater, and they, and they weren't either. I remember one of the things we had to talk to people about was uh, you're not allowed to put your hand up in your face when the lights are on you. Because in theater, if the lights are on you, that's a good thing because that means people can see you and you don't need to shirk the light. You actually need to find the light. That's why I said when my eyes are out of the I wanted to square because we've had theater workshops in the community now. But, uh, but anyway, we've got eight places and we've been fortunate to get a lot of funding. Um, one thing I learned about challenges is one we that first project we had two thousand people involved in our community and build a community organization around ordinary people participating in the arts in our county that uh, sustained us for fifteen years. But at this point, um, you get nothing. I mean, old people know this. Nothing stays fixed. It's like you can organize a community and then you look out ten years later, you got to organize it again. And I think that's where we were. We coasted on that first huge raft of organizing, and that's kind of our challenge right now. So here are some of the things that I heard that I want to highlight. Uh, and we talked, we talked about the centers of civic life are more difficult to access because of decreasing population and geography. Um, just getting to a place can take two hours. Um, we talked talk about uh, why would you waste your time? That really struggled. Why would you waste your time coming here? Um, and the deep history of stereotypes, both stereotypes about the region and stereotypes about people within the region. And where do brands come from? Uh, and telling stories cross-culturally. So I wanted, hearing some of these things as the backdrop, these are some of the challenges. And are these new challenges, or at least have these been ongoing challenges? Um, but I also want to raise the question, and given all of this, what are the opportunities for artists who are doing work in rural communities. To, I don't know if this is true. I've heard the story that um, 
there's one brushstroke difference between crisis and opportunity in um, Chinese calligraphy. So if we have these challenges, what are the opportunities for where do you sit and the work that you're doing to be so deeply engaged in your communities, even if you're returning, Becca? Uh, what are some of the challenges, opportunities that you see? Who wants to go first? I will tell. I know you will, and I'm close to you. So. <laughs> and we friends, so I don't know. Um, I, for me, I really do believe the cross-cultural conversations in our community um, are great opportunities. Not only for us to be better together, but I think it's part of our individual healing. Like to really understand about the cultural art um, in my community is something that we don't really understand that this matters to not only us but to other people and that other people would really be interested. Like, did you enjoy the cultural presentation this morning? <laughs> like, those things really matter and continue to weed that through um, and that every story matters. So for me, I feel like just getting those stories out, we recently started a, a cat photo opportunity with um, the young mothers in our community who took uh, cameras, went out and told their stories, and then they created this whole series around them that we'll be doing a large production on for folks to come and see. So it's these cross-cultural conversations at diff different levels of understanding that I think can heal us individually, collectively, and across the county as well. Big opportunity for us. Thanks. The microphone to me. Um, I don't mean to have something to say yet, though, so I'll just start talking and see what comes out. But uh, I feel like there was a huge opportunity. We were talking about uh, centers of civic life and access to them. And I feel like there's an opportunity to increase community ownership of the work that's being done. Uh, I've, I've had a kind of pie in the sky uh, idea of. What about creating some kind of theater mobile, like a book mobile, so that the, the tools of making uh, could arrive in some of these community spaces that are still operating, or perhaps in some of the community spaces that have been feeling uh, a kind of the weight of the circumstance and the, the lack of resources? Because I think there's something very powerful about uh, new life coming into a space that's been feeling like it's struggling to keep its life going. and. Um, so I think, and I think that that doing that, it starts to kind of connect the, it could connect the dots between these dis disparate communities, and it can also uh, give these communities, continue to give folks ownership over the work that Roadside is making, which is something that has long been part of its its history and its commitment. Uh, so I think that's, there is a, a way in which the, once again, that this um, the geographic isolation, even if it increases, that this becomes uh, an opportunity to, as you say, kind of get out of these silos. That one thing doesn't automatically mean um, isolation in a in a way that is is permanent. I would say that um, the opportunity, our, our group over the years, we've tried to focus on what everybody think needs, thinks needs talking about as we're trying to figure out what to do plays about things. You know, the, the idea of, because we have a lot of difference within our cast and within our community. We've got rich and poor, we've got black and white, we've got old and young, we've got, I mean, it's its a very um, diverse group. And I think that for the first 10 years of our existence, we were able to kind of proceed to make work on that big tent model. I think that a couple things happened. One, of course, the 2016 election, uh, and, I, and I think social media, the, the presence of social media in rural communities where people could have an identity that was separate from the one that they had when they saw people in the grocery store, but 
when I saw you in the grocery store, I knew what you were saying online. It wasn't like uh, you were anonymous. You were still you, but you were acting like nobody, could, nobody knew what you were talking about. You know, and that really created a riff, not a riff, but it made that uh, community work, working together, feeling like you're, you got something in common um, more difficult. Uh, and in some ways, I was thinking about this during uh, Lisa and her group's piece, piece we just saw about sexualized violence, is that those things are out there in a way they haven't been in the broader culture in my life. And it's harder. I mean, I have to imagine if you're suffering through some of the things that I never suffered through, in some ways it's got to feel better that at least is getting out there and, and more people are out to engage with something that they could pretend like wasn't happening before. And I think that that's, that's been the gift that Trump and his supporters have given us. A lot of us thought things weren't like they were, but they are like they are, and they have been like they are. And now we're in a, now we're in a place in our society that we, we're like, well, we better go ahead and figure out how we're going to respond to this or, or the whole boat is going to get swamped and go down. That we've been acting like people that, not everybody, but there have been people who have been acting like it ain't happening. And now the opportunity is that a lot more people are like, oh, things are not as good as I thought they were and um, let's go ahead and, and start from there. And I think that's a real opportunity for people like, like everybody really. Actually, I'm still stuck on relevance of the ARC, and I'm, I'm stuck on something. I don't know if maybe you all know. I learned in the last month that the ARC has actually started resending money, taking money back, when organizations use words like equity and diversity. That they have been driven by this current cycle of politics to think that in the Appalachian region, in these places, those kind of buzzwords are, are negative to the communities that we serve. And, and those folks and those communities don't want to hear those kind of words. And it, it, it's been eating on me for about the last three weeks since I had this conversation with somebody who, who has had the experience being told that, you know, you need to change your funding because anybody with the words diversity and equity, we're not going to be in that right now because the people that we serve, they don't want to hear that. And so, I, I, just, I got triggered by that, I guess, but that's kind of the thing that's been sitting on me. And I think maybe this is the place where the conversation needs to start. How do we reshape the narrative and, and rebuild right, the conversation that we know we're having to, to, as a counter narrative to the story that the whole nation believes about this place in particular, but general rule in general, that, that, that they are because they predominantly voted for you know, Donald J, that they have this, this monolithic single sense of who they and what they are. And so I, I, I think that just kind of hit me and so I've been trying to figure out, and I, I guess we can extrovert that so that I can just be as transparent as possible. I think that is the most dangerous thing I've heard in our community of creativity and arts in a long time. That somebody is making the assumption way out away from where we are on the ground that people that don't look like they like, act like talking to each other, don't want to have conversations that include each other. And there's absolutely the antithesis of the experience we've all had working and doing this work, not over weeks and months, but decades, okay? And, and so I think that that just really struck me. And I, that's, where I, that's where I'm right now. It just kind of hit me. Yeah. Go ahead. Which is that, um, I mean, hearing what you were just talking about and what you were saying about social media and this kind of how that has allowed people to have a, a private face that may not uh, require them to engage publicly in the same way they did before. I think one of the things that that roadside has been supporting and advocating for and investing in recently is um, free spaces, this uh, community spaces of power. And um, I feel like this, it all ties in, right? This this isolation, whether it's geographic or whether it's digital, that to you have to invest in those spaces that do allow everyone to come 
in that where everybody feels like they own space, where everybody feels like they can contribute and their voice matters. Uh, and I think that is a, a strategy that is worth uh, everybody investing some time and thought into. Like how, how can, even if we're, you know, uh, if, if we feel like we're artists and we're struggling to make ends meet, how can we still provide value to those spaces that are allowing that kind of civic conversation to happen? How can we, what value can we give? I think it goes back to what this idea that, that nothing stays fixed. I think that you know this is not the first time that we've had politicized hate and racialized hate and fear um, coming out of the seats of power and empowering people who are um, scared and hateful. I mean, I think that you know organizing and just confronting people. You got to. We have to talk to people. We have to talk to each other. And, but we, we have all the models of the 60s and the 50s uh, in the civil rights movement that none of that stuff was easy won and none of it was won by anything but mixing it up with people. That, and that there were a lot of rich people involved in the civil rights movement, there were a lot of poor people involved in the civil rights movement. And I, I mean, I'm doing my work, it was highly oriented by, I mean, in my case, reading about it and listening to people talk about it and being involved with people in the Deep South. But, you know, you, those battles have to be won every generation. I think people in my generation were fortunate in that the, uh, a lot of things have been won. And, I mean, you know, they, they got to be won again. And, and I just believe strongly that, that I mean, I've, I, this is me speaking. I've been in retreat. You know, it's like I, the, I kind of recoiled from 2016, and I didn't talk to people in my community the same way that I did before that happened. And um, we had a situation where we were going to play this summer based on this uh, blockade that these coal miners uh, did when their company went bankrupt and uh, their, their paychecks all bounced. And, um, and all kinds of people on the left were coming out to support them. And it took me a minute, because I know what great coal miners voted for Donald Trump in 2016. And it took me a minute to decide whether I was going to go get involved in this. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm like, I need, this, this is my community. And I saw, you know, my lesbian community organizers out there making sure everybody was fed. And I saw my African-American UMWA buddies going out to help these non-union miners, and it was just like, you gotta go out and look people in the eye and figure out how to reconcile your own values with what's happening to people in this country, so. Yeah. But I mean, history teaches us there's so many good, I mean, I was thinking about this when they were talking about the South. Highlander is a Southern institution. The North did not come up with Highlander, the South came up with Highlander. And I think that's true for a lot of social justice work in this country. and I wish we had a lot more time just to have this conversation. Um, some of the things that you're digging into, it's not just about the stories, it's also about the history that it doesn't get passed on, it's so not unless you're really going out to study it, you're not going to know the history. So I'm really appreciative that you're bringing the historical um, moments and, uh, and movements that may change. Change doesn't happen from the top down. Change only ever happens from the ground up. It's only the people who have, uh, uh, who are experiencing the neck of, of the systems on, the foot of the, the foot of the systems on their neck who are the ones who are going to organize and protest. Uh, there's, so there is a need to protest, but what I'm also hearing is this piece about being able to look your neighbor in the eye and understand that you may not agree, um, but the value of community and working together is something that if we can get ourselves to that place, we can turn this puppy around. But it's going to take work. We can't sit on the sidelines. So given that, what are some of the other activities or events or uh, 
opportunities that you're seeing in your communities that are giving you great hope at the moment. Is that a vision question? Okay. Um, so I, I think I kind of have my maybe four or five bullet points. One is definitely, um, and I kind of got inspired from this conversation to be more proactive in these cross-cultural conversations that can really promote learning and healing and really begin to create emotional justice in my community. And because we are so strongly indigenous, for me, part of that vision would include that indigenous story isn't only one of the past, um, and that we are known and not imagined um, is really important. Um, and that then in my community, I would hear drones. They would be sometimes um, culturally separate, and then at times, I would love to hear all drums play together. In Robinson County, it happened to me once when I was in Huma Nation around climate justice, and the only drums were there, and there was an African drumming there. And when the drums started, I thought, oh my God, this is so discordant. It will never be music. But if, after about three bars, it was like glorious. And I thought, wow, more of that. And the same also with dancing. Um, and uh, for me, that art and love um, are medicine and practice. Um, as you know, I'm new to the community, and so I'm still learning what's going on. Uh, one thing that is exciting for me is that Roadside has a uh, national coalition that the other young leader uh, that I'm working with has been working his blood off for the last three, four years to put into uh, action. He's the lead organizer on that coalition. And um, we've got partners up in West Baltimore at the Arch Social Club, we've got partners down in Uniontown, Alabama, and we've got partners over in uh, near Milwaukee. And right outside, it's a, it's a rural urban uh, collaboration. And so I have been, had the privilege to sit in on some of their steering committee meetings, on some of their conversations. And we're going to have a huge annual meeting in March where all those folks are going to come up to West Baltimore and get together and have conversations. Um, but they're, they're all community centers of power and they're folks who are doing work in their communities that need to be done. And uh, it's been really, really lovely to be part of those conversations and the listening ear and hear the amount of value that they receive from simply being in communication with each other. Um, you know, they're still finding their way in terms of what is this coalition, um, how, what are all the different ways that we can support each other, but simply having conversations about the work at hand, simply having that, that sense of solidarity, I think is a huge inspiration for all of those folks. And then uh, we're going to be, or it's going to be collaborating with uh, the Art Social Club in West Baltimore over the next year to make a play. So. Well, who knows what's going to come out of that, but we're really excited about it. Uh, I just got back from visiting them uh, last week, I think it was. Uh, yeah. I'll just keep this one. Um, I think a part of what my experience has been stepping back into this real creative engagement work in the last five years is is have the chance to, to tell very powerful personal stories of, of African Americans in American history, that's what I do in my, in my, my performance, in communities that are almost completely homogenous and, and non-African American. But the response that, that I received from folks who, you know, not just in Appalachia, but across rural America, who embraced the idea that being pressed on the story they've been told, uh, to finally have someone Give, give them a, a space where they can finally say, you know what, I knew that shit was black. Right? You know, I've, I've been rolling with this for 30 years, and, and I appreciate you coming here and confirming that this isn't the only story. And, and I, I've been really heartened and, 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 and filled up with the conversations with, in, in some, you know, in rural Idaho and, you know, West Virginia and Virginia and Kentucky, you know, folks saying, I've been living with this story, this narrative for a long time, and I'm glad to finally know that there are other stories 
that I can hold on to that are just as powerful part of mine. And, and I think for me, that's been a, a great, great place to, to get back into this work and those conversations. And, and then recently, I've been doing a lot of creative engagement with uh, community action councils in rural Appalachia, specifically helping them create creative engagement tools to work with returning citizens from prison from the courts and really change the conversation about how we build, using the arts, real, viable human beings that have those essential skills that every person needs to live in harmony in their community and from that re rebuilding their humanity. And that, that's been a really interesting place to be. And I, I've had the pleasure of, of doing some work with, with Robert, with our place trying to figure out how we take their sunsetting money and use it in Appalachia, um, and, and being with the folks at Apple Shop. And so I, I just kind of, as I get back to this work, those have been the, the real bright spots. And then working uh, on the big scale with, 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 with the dream of my wife, who does this education access and very intentional art making across rural Kentucky, Appalachia, Kentucky, that as a vehicle for creating education and opportunity for career with, with the folks in those rural communities that have been displaced and disconnected. So those are kind of the, the, the hot spots right now. I was thinking about that Our Place project that Hassan was talking about. I'll come back to it in a second. But we, uh, we, got, we got, we're fortunate to receive some funding to where we can hire new, to, we're fortunate we can replace me. So I'm, we're hiring a person to be the creative director for Higher Ground and uh, have a lot of enthusiastic, um, talented, uh, bright-eyed applicants and the, just the urge to tell them what a mistake they're making <laughs> to, to get into this line of work is almost uncontrollable. But they don't... I'm not going to, you know, I'm smart enough to know what not to tell them. And I, and I think the same has been true with this art place process that where, you know, there's a big chunk of change on the table and they've asked 100 people to figure it out together and it's real crazy and chaotic, but they they have a lot of great young people at the table, including Joe Tolbert, who's here, and others may be here, and if you are, you're awesome too. But it's just as like so uh, hope inducing. I mean, I guess it's the nature of things. I've never been old before, I but I can imagine. Looking back now, I see that people were just sitting there kind of letting us figure it out, and that's the way of the world, right? But it genuinely is happening. That this is the next generation of leadership, and this work is uh, uh, just as crazy as we were. And so that is awesome, because we've come a long way. We've got a lot done. So, um, So I was talking about work that wasn't my own. I want to make sure that I mention a few things. One is the name of that coalition I was talking about, which is Performing Our Future. And the other one is uh, the fact that the uh, local, as in the Letcher County uh, free space that I was talking about, is the Letcher County Culture Hub. I didn't mention them. I just assumed you knew. <laughs> Thank you. So here's my last question with that five minutes. What, what is needed to further this moment? And money is one, big one. But if we wait for money to do the work, it'll never happen, right? So it's not really about money. What is needed to further this moment? Um, so maybe Karen can come to my conversation, come into my community and help us with these conversations. That could be useful. Um, yeah, and, and I think um, literally this thing of hope, you know, you're talking about me inducing hope, I think somehow, because I find that once folks lift themselves out of apathy, which sometimes happens in my community, their creative spark is genius, and so finding a way to help just lift the apathy, and sometimes it can be tied to you coming to our community and seeing the work that we're doing there and validating it, because when you're place based, you don't leave. And so we kind of swim in our own collective culture. So if some of y'all come and applaud the work that we do so that we get some sense that it has validity because we're not going to leave and come out here as we're y'all have been here today, just saying. Uh, I have a quick answer, which is simply for everyone to have faith in the value of what they do. 
I think intentional community building, right? I'm being very intentional about how we connect with folks and who we connect with, create those invitations and those moments of honest storytelling. I think, you know, we have the ability to really exchange our stories and listen with empathy, right, to, to not respond to, but to take in and understand. Uh, I think that's the place where I can see we can get a lot of work done. Knowing each other better, then we can get into those deeper and more difficult conversations as we build those relationships. I think, and this kind of builds off what's been said in my mind anyway, and what's needed is um, courage. And I think that um, courage understood as a collective act. That courage is something we can encourage other people to, to encourage them to have courage. That makes sense, doesn't it? But, to, uh, but just to, um, for us to fuck each other up and for us to go ahead and stand in the fire line together and um, don't send people out front to be the cannon fodder for the, the cultural war that's ahead of us, but for us to get in together and be strategic. Um, but yeah, I'm finding myself having to uh, screw up my own courage and remember that, that I owe that to the people who were brave for me. Well, I, I think that's it. Well, a couple minutes early, you might not got my time right. <laughs> But I don't think there's any wrong, anything wrong with ending early. <laughs> Decompromise our practice. We do not have to go to time. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening and shuffling around. <laughs> we have to do the work, son. Uh, and just thank you for listening. Have a great.